and Honorable Profession is brought to you by Tech for America, an organization dedicated to providing a platform to solve America's toughest public challenges. For more information, visit t4a.org. That's T, the number four, a.org. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports some of the most thoughtful and innovative voices in American politics. If you don't believe me, listen to some of our past episodes with guests like Pete Buttigieg, St. Louis Treasurer Tashara Jones, Congressman Ben McAdams, and more than a dozen amazing leaders at the state and local level. You can find us at newdealleaders.org or wherever podcasts are found. Today, I'm talking with San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo. Sam is running a city of a million people in Silicon Valley. Today, we're going to talk about what he sees as these companies grow, disrupt, and change our lives and communities. He's a former prosecutor and a city council member, and most importantly, a forward-thinking and engaged leader. I think you'll enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Welcome to An Honorable Profession. It's a pleasure having you. Uh, we've known each other for a bunch of years, and I look forward to having this conversation you know, live and recorded uh, that we've been having for many years about how you balance technology and democracy and community uh, in this modern world. And congratulations on the great successes you're having in San Jose right now. Thanks, Ryan. It's really a pleasure to be on the show. So let's start with your path into public service. You're a local yeah. boy. Uh, yeah. You grew up here, uh, left Harvard Law School, but came back to serve first as a prosecutor and then elective office. Tell me about the decision you made when you were first deciding about whether you wanted to run and how, it, how it's different than being a prosecutor and working in that aspect of public service. Yeah, I wish I could say I had a great strategy in mind for my political career. Uh, but it was pretty accidental. Uh, there was an empty seat, and I had, <laughs> I had been uh, serving as a, as a criminal prosecutor in the sexual assault unit at the DA's office for many years. And uh, you usually emotionally reach a certain uh, statute of limitations in that role just because it's very emotional work, particularly with child victims and so forth. So I was really looking to move on, do other things, probably in the DA's office, but some friends had told me, hey, there's an open city council seat downtown. And I'd always had a passion around housing and transit. I actually got a master's in public policy because I really care a lot about urban policy. And anyway, I thought about ways to get involved. So I started uh, going to some neighborhood meetings just to check it out, see what was going on. There were like nine candidates in the race. I'm certain I had absolutely no chance whatsoever. And more than one person told me that. And uh, <laughs> And nonetheless, I got in because I thought it would be cool to take a break <laughs> from, from work for That's a few months. That's one kind of break. Yeah, it is. <sighs> and I just started knocking on doors. I had a lot of fun, and it all worked out somehow. And tell me about knocking on that first door or making that first fundraising call. Yeah. Like, how, how different is it than showing up and arguing in court and the other things that you had done – you know, uh, professionally previously. Yeah, you know, you think that, you know, a guy who'd had probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 jury trials by that point would just feel naturally comfortable in front of people. But I was terrified uh, knocking on doors uh, and uh, about twice as terrified raising money. And, uh, of course, no politician likes raising money. It's just what you do, uh, as you know. But uh, what I learned after the f- probably the third or fourth door of knocking was that this is actually a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great way to get to know a community and really understand what people care passionately about. And, and what I learned really was the best way to start a conversation is with a question, which is what do you care about? What can we fix? What, what's going on in the neighborhood and what's wrong with it and what can we do? Uh, and usually people want to engage because people naturally, certainly in San Jose, and I know this is true in lots of other places, people naturally want their community to improve and, and they'll engage with you when you start with a question. And, Speaking of questions, so we're sitting up here on the 18th floor looking out over Silicon Valley, and San Jose yes. is obviously the major city in that. And this community has changed a lot from when you grew up here. Yeah. Uh, you've had major tech growth, which has created a huge amount of opportunity and also challenges. Um, as cities around the country and, in fact, around the world start to try to adapt to the, the rise of technology and disruption, um, what can what's the lesson learned uh, that you can share from from the from ground zero here 
uh, in Silicon Valley about how to interact with technology, how to embrace it, how to hold it accountable. Ryan, the lessons are still being learned, uh, but certainly what we're seeing here in San Jose and a lot of other communities throughout the country where technology plays such a dominant role is uh, as critically important as, as tech growth is to the future of our economy and as good as it can be, we know it's also very polarizing economically. And there are just so many thousands of families that are being left out of the extraordinary prosperity that we have here. Uh, we see that in a myriad of ways, certainly with our, our fast growing homeless population. And the great challenge, of course, is how we're going to enable more people to have the skills to be able to survive and thrive in a tech enabled economy. And I don't think anyone's figured that out yet. Uh, this is not simple stuff. Can you talk about some of the things you're doing to try to create some equity in this in this new world? Yeah, we. I mean, we've launched a lot of different initiatives, and some are getting traction, and others are. You know, we're still working on it. Um, most recently, we created uh, a digital equity fund, uh, essentially trying to conquer the digital divide. We have about a hundred thousand people here in San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, who do not have uh, any kind of broadband access in their homes. And so uh, we engaged in pretty extensive negotiations with a lot of the big telecoms uh, where we were able to cut deals that enabled us to create a fund so that they could deploy small cells. And we have the l largest small cell deployment in the country. Those are little devices that are going to be used increasingly for 5G and, and wireless. And uh, with that revenue, then we're going to be using a significant amount of that for infrastructure and devices uh, to help low-income communities particularly our youth, uh, because we know we've got too many kids who are, you know, doing their homework in a parking lot of Burger King just to be able to get a Wi-Fi signal. Uh, we know that's a huge barrier uh, for too many of our kids. Uh, and clearly that barrier is aligned along racial lines and economic lines. And I want to talk about, a little bit about that negotiation. I mean, you negotiated with the telecom companies around this. You've been a national leader in saying um, that while Amazon was out shopping for the best deal they could from different communities in terms of tax breaks around the country, that you weren't interested in offering tax breaks. And in fact, you're uh, recruiting Google without any tax breaks and, and with a lot of conditions on how the community will benefit. Can you talk about both your philosophy around uh, economic development and tax breaks, but then also... Um, sort of what you're doing with that specific deal to try to generate equity and, you know, a positive benefit for the entire community? Yeah, you know, this is a, a great challenge, I know, for lots of communities, how you attract jobs at the same time that um, taxpayers reasonably expect that you're not going to give away the store in doing so. And, you know, I work very hard to try to see how we can grow tech jobs here in San Jose, just like any community would want to. Uh, but what we've generally found is that... Uh, the incentives, tax benefits, subsidies, uh, fee breaks generally don't have much role in the dis location decisions of tech employers. They're looking for talent first and foremost. They're looking for access to infrastructure, particularly transit. Uh, they're looking uh, for places where their competitors might be in particular. Um, they're looking for a lot of things, and whatever we can offer them is pretty much a rounding error on their quarterly balance sheet. And so, um, you know, we learned the lesson after the redevelopment agency went away back in 2011. Throughout the state of California, we had these things called redevelopment agencies that were sort of cash cows for, for programs like this uh, for economic development. And the state eliminated them all, and, and it was probably a blessing for us uh, because we stopped believing that we had to write a check to get someone interested in employing people here, and we started being more resourceful. And you have Google now coming to downtown San Jose. Can yeah. you talk about, you know, sort of what you're asking for from them in order to yeah. to, to see the benefits across your community? Yeah, I and mean, the good news is, uh, you know, Google met with me a couple of years ago in my office, and and the senior uh, team. Uh, talked a little bit about their vision and what they want to do, and it all sounded fantastic. They're they're building out millions of square feet around our our transit hub called Daredon Station, where we have several different transit lines converging uh, in the core of our city. Uh, and this campus, which may be as many as 8 million square feet, which would be about three times the size of the Apple World headquarters, this is a really significant wow. campus. 
And, and the one thing I said to them was, look, you know, we can't give you any money. We don't have any money to give. We're, we're broke like a lot of cities. Um, and they say, you know, we're not going to ask for any. We're not looking for it. Just treat us fairly. Treat us like you would treat others. Um, you know, we'll pay the fees as long as they're not exorbitant. Uh, and, you know, the good news is they've gone a step further. Uh, we just signed an MOU with them a few months ago that has them agreeing to pay for housing impact fee uh, for the commercial development. We're going to impose that really throughout the whole downtown. Uh, they're going to be paying millions of dollars in community benefits as we expand the footprint, for example, by allowing them to build taller. Uh, in exchange for those entitlements, they'll be giving us some dollars. Uh, and they've committed uh, to build housing integrated with their campus. And in particular, that 25% of that housing would be rent restricted and affordable. So those are all great benefits for our community. So I'm thrilled uh, that they're willing to be so community minded. I know not all employers are that way. And I don't pretend that all communities can get those kinds of deals. We had a very unique setup here, but what is clear is that whatever the assets are of the community, um, money does not make a tech company uh, more interested. And I know there's been a lot of fallout since the Amazon mess in New York. And, but the reality is the billions of dollars that we're being offered are just absolutely not going to pay in the long run. And taxpayers are, are really getting robbed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's money that can be spent in other places that can yeah. create a broader benefit. Absolutely. Um, so we have a bunch of 20 and every day it's growing more uh, Democratic candidates for president. And they're all seeming to struggle a little bit with negotiating how they talk about technology. Let me interrupt you there, sure. because that's actually the main reason why I'm on your show, Ryan. Because I heard you had Pete Buttigieg, and I listened to it. It was fantastic. But he did not announce his candidacy for presidency. That's so this right. is my opportunity now. <laughs> You're 21? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm announcing it for 2028. Just okay. in advance, give myself some runway. But you heard it here first. <laughs> On the Ryan Coonerty Show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. It's an honorable uh, profession exclusive. Yeah. So how do you, when all these candidates come knocking on Silicon Valley's door and they call you and they're like, Sam, how do we, how should I talk about tech to the rest of the country? What's, you know, what's that, what's to the Democratic Party's stance around technology be, do you think? You know, I think there's been a lot of tech bashing uh, nationally, and I don't think it's good for the country. Uh, I know it's not good for tech, but I, I, in the long run, uh, it's going to set us back a long way. We have to recognize where the economy is going. And um, trying to be first in the race to um, constrain the growth uh, of technology or constrain the success of technology companies in our country um, is not going to be a recipe for a future economic success. We know that these companies are very mobile. They're very nimble. They're already all over the world. And if they're not going to grow here, they'll simply choose to grow somewhere else. Uh, and so I think we need a relationship uh, it's really founded on a little more mutual respect, uh, not to say that all technology companies are good. We know their companies are doing bad things uh, and we need regulation to protect consumers. We need regulation to protect workers. But we also need to recognize where the future is. And we're simply never going to recreate uh, the coal jobs and the steel jobs, although I know certainly our president is working very hard in that regard, and I'm sure he can cite some very modest short-term successes. But those jobs are going to go away as soon as uh, the tariffs go away, the quotas evaporate, whatever they might be. And in the end, we've got an economy that is rapidly uh, digitizing. It's rapidly moving toward AI and a whole host of different technologies. And we've got to be nimble enough to move with it. And so I'd like to see Democratic Party embrace that more uh, and recognize that uh, there can be a collaborative relationship with tech. There's a lot of great tech companies that are doing incredibly positive things. I'll give you an example. Cisco Systems just announced they're giving $50 million for homeless initiatives here in San Jose. Um, you know, they're partnering with, with us in a host of other ways, uh, focused on trying to see how we can uh, bridge the digital divide. There are a lot of companies that do care. Let's find partners out there and stop beating them up. Welcome to our new sponsor, OpenCounter.com. OpenCounter builds tools for local governments that help them deliver permits and licenses to residents online. 
Their portals guide applicants through complex permitting workflows to allow them to navigate and invest in your community. Designed to lower transaction costs, increase transparency, and empower economic development, OpenCounter is a vital tool for communities big and small across this nation, including Atlanta, Charlotte, Indianapolis, Oakland, and San Diego. Check out opencounter.com to see what they can do to modernize your community's approach to permitting and licensing. And how does, so there's, there's, there's the political relationship between the party or candidates and tech. There's also local government's relationship with tech. And they are nimble uh, and in many cases uh, are willing to come in and disrupt and then try to get permission later. <laughs> how, does, how do you think local government and state government needs to adapt to, to deal with how, these, how fast things are changing. Um, certainly people can't wait years and years and years for us to go through processes yeah. to, approve, to approve what, they're, what they want to do. What, what are you doing in San Jose here to try to, to try to adapt local government to the new realities? And you're right. We, we do need to learn how to be more nimble. I think we also need to be clearer about our objectives uh, because I find that uh, when we set the ground rules early, uh, companies will understand what they need to jump over or through. Uh, and, um, you know, if they don't like it, they'll leave, but at least everybody understands the rules. You know, the scooters are certainly a good example. These scooters are terrorizing <laughs> streets uh, in every city of our country right now. Uh, and uh, I've ridden a few times, they're kind of fun, but I understand there's plenty of perils and lots of emergency room admissions. You know, what we announced just a, a month or two ago was, look, if you want a permit to operate scooters, they're great. But we want every company that gets a permit to have a technology that enables them to geofence. That is, we identify sidewalks where we've got lots of pedestrians or, or, or a lot of seniors or wherever we think it might be too perilous to be riding a scooter on a sidewalk. And of course, they're illegal to be riding on sidewalks anyway. Uh, and we want you to be able to deploy technology that essentially keeps these things off of sidewalks uh, where we know they shouldn't be anyway. Those kinds of uh, ground rules um, create clarity. And what we found from two of the companies was, hey, we accept the challenge. Uh, we want to be the first to develop this because we know other cities are going to probably require this too. And if we can be first out of the gate, there's a market advantage for us. So there are ways in which we can use, you know, good communication, create clarity, and hopefully work with a market to ensure technology works with us rather than against us. Do you think that's a third way? I mean, so you have some cities that are Everything's a go. Whatever happens, happens. You have some yeah. cities, it's absolutely not. Uh, it's interesting. How do you develop what those outcomes are that you want them to work towards? Because what is what? Obviously, you don't want people riding scooters through crowds of people or yeah. in dangerous places. Um, but you have to be nimble enough and have community conversations enough to think through. You know what it is that what it is that you want at the end of this, so that they can build the technology and hopefully abide by the regulations. Uh, are, how do you how do you talk to your community and or talk to your department heads uh, when these things come on? Because I think people's initial reaction is just to say no. Uh, yeah. And so how do you get them to say yes with conditions? Yeah, get them, get them to maybe. Um, and I, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's something of the Goldilocks approach here, and and we don't want to just say no because there are great advantages certainly. Um, you know, in the case of scooters, or electric bikes, certainly mobility, and and what we're seeing more and more is opportunities for folks who are not able to afford cars to actually uh, be able to get to work in school. So, you know, certainly it is hard to anticipate all the iterations and impacts of, of, of technology and what it's going to do in our cities. We spend a lot of time watching other cities and figuring out what's going on and learning. Uh, and we're all making mistakes along the way, and we have to learn from each other's mistakes. That has been helpful for us. As we think about, for example, privacy, which I know is a huge challenge for cities to figure out, a lot of IoT infrastructure is being deployed out there. It's getting a lot of data, um, and some of that data is data I think all of us would prefer not to have in the public uh, realm. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that are going to take years to work out and we're, we're just not going to get it right the first time. And so, you know, we need to be patient uh, and we also need to be really focused on learning from each other. And that requires a lot of communication between the cities. And, you know, that's why, you know, I benefit so much from, from talking to smart folks in other cities like Ryan Coonerty, for example. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, yeah, actually you bring up a good point, which is so much of government is you 
you know, you spend forever, you make a rule, and then that rule sits for 50 years, come hell or high water. Uh, but if you want to, in some ways, you have to just keep adapting to these all these unintended consequences that you're seeing. Yes, and it's always the unintended consequence that makes a front page. It's never what you want to do that you succeeded in doing. That will never make the front. I thought there was. A, I think there's a great <laughs> book uh, about uh, unintended consequences that actually are far greater than the intended consequences ever could be, but yes. they had huge, profound impacts. So let's talk about an unintended consequence, which is housing. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> as we've seen this amazing growth, housing has become a crisis. Yeah. Um, and you're trying to adapt these old government systems to find new ways to get housing quickly. Can you talk about what you're seeing that's working and maybe what's not working and what's the path out when when you have houses that are hitting a million dollar medians? Yeah. You know, there, we haven't fixed this by any stretch. We've got a huge affordable housing crisis in San Jose um, and more than 4,300 homeless individuals on any given night. So in a city of about 1.1 million, uh, that's a lot of people. And we know uh, there's a lot of work we have to do. We've been doing everything we can to find more resources to build affordable housing, certainly passing bond measures and so forth. Um, but the reality is we can't possibly tax people fast enough <laughs> uh, to be able to pay for the affordable housing that's needed when it costs more than $600,000 a unit to build an apartment in the city. An awful lot of our time is focused on seeing how we could do more, build faster and cheaper using prefab modular technologies, uh, particularly when we're talking about rent restricted housing, we've got a couple projects underway doing that. Um, some interesting concepts around co-living. We've got the nation's largest co-living project breaking ground in a couple of weeks. These are basically uh, what you might call very high amenity dorm rooms. <laughs> yep. uh, so folks are, are living in relatively small spaces with shared kitchens and living spaces. And we think for millennials, it could be actually a great solution. Um, we're, we're exploring every kind of innovation imaginable. We even had a guy who was trying to build a floating foundation up in the Alviso, which is a sort of this, um, uh, somewhat swampy soil, uh, near the, the, near the bay, because we know there's going to be sea level rise. And he's thinking that if he could make the foundation float, it would, uh, enable us to be sustainable, really, uh, regardless of what may happen with, with climate change. You know, there's a lot of ideas out there. Not yeah. all of them are going to work, and that <laughs> one is floundering right now. But, but we got to try them all because yeah. we're in a crisis. And, you know, particularly around homelessness, uh, it's just so dire. We've been converting motels to apartments. We find that's pretty cost-effective. We've been building tiny homes, which are about $7,000 a unit. We can do it pretty inexpensively with Habitat for Humanity doing the building. And uh, they're pretty interesting. they got, you know, electricity and heat and... Uh, and, and cooling in them, but all this stuff requires land, which is very challenging because it involves conversations with communities that often don't want uh, whatever it is that's getting built. Uh, and we know land's They want it. They just don't want it in their neighborhood. They want it somewhere Where else. else. That's a great idea. Just It's a great else. idea somewhere else. <laughs> that is the story of our efforts. In terms of, in terms of housing, um, you know, it's a it's a national problem, yeah. but it's been left to cities to yeah. solve with scarce resources. If you if you had a magic wand and you could bring the state or the federal government into the conversation, what what do we need to see from them in order to to have you have success here on the ground? Because yeah. San Jose can't solve it uh, can't solve this problem by itself. Yeah, we recognize there's been a real abdication responsibility on the federal side. Fortunately, here in California, we've got a governor and a legislature who care, and they're they're really committed to, to putting in resources. But, you know, the reality is for local governments, it's really up to us to be nimble and innovative. And we have the ability to do things more quickly. We're not as partisan. We're not surrounded by a sea of lobbyists. That enables us, I think, to be more creative and innovative. Um, you know, a program we just launched, a couple that we just launched in the last few months are, are showing that you know, in some ways, it's it's better not to have federal money because you don't have the strings that are attached to it. We launched, for example, what we discovered is for three years now, we, we've been counting the number of homeless people we've been housing. We housed more than 6,000 people in Santa Clara County over a three-year period of time. And the problem hasn't gotten any better. Right. Because, of course, although those folks are mostly staying housed, other people are getting pushed out on the street. And so... We're now coming around to the view, well, maybe what we really need to do is provide some emergency funding for folks 
when they're about to get their eviction notice and see how we can help families stay in. Um, and so we tried to pilot and just incredibly successful. 97% of the families of the more than 500 families that we, we test stayed housed over, over a year period of time with a very small investment, maybe $3,000 a family. And so it was, it just that, helps them make rent in the, exactly. in the months where it's tough. Exactly. Wow. And, and we know, you know, it's the crisis. It's somebody lost a job. It's the health crisis, whatever it might be that pushes somebody out. And when they're out, then that's a much more expensive problem to solve. And obviously, a whole lot more impactful in terms of human misery. So having a prevention program can do so much wonders, but you'll never get federal funding for it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the, the kinds of restrictions on federal dollars and Congress would be worried about it being wasted and so forth. And we're doubling down on it. We just poured another $4 million in the program because we think this is one of the few things that may actually work. Right. And yeah, and the, the, the cost to, 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 to individual lives, to kids, to the community is so yeah. much less. I agree. Getting upstream is so hard because you could see you could see the costs coming at you. Yeah. Uh, in the criminal justice system, in social services, and homelessness, um, and all the incentives are to spend the money at the back end and not to spend the money at the front end. Yet, the front end is where you're gonna is where you can make the biggest difference. A uh, couple last questions. So one is you had a big bike crash. I did. Uh, a couple a uh, couple months ago. One, how are you doing? And two. It's one thing to sort of injure yourself when you're a private citizen and have to recover. It's another thing to have to injure yourself and then uh, go to press conferences. And, <laughs> still and have, high on painkillers. Yeah, still high on painkillers <laughs> and people talk about it. So like, that was so, cool. So what's it like to – yeah, so what's it like to sort of recover from a major injury yeah. uh, in, the, in the public eye? That's a, it's a yeah. weird phenomenon. Well, I guess the relevant detail wasn't so much that there was a bike crash, but that there was an SUV Im- involved in, right. the, in the collision, uh, and that's what really did me in. So, um, yeah, so I had a couple broken vertebrae and a broken sternum. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. You know, I was able to walk the next day, although not with a lot of help. Um, and, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I was on painkillers in the emergency room with a whole lot of media outside, and I had to go out and make a statement. And uh, I've watched the video since and thought, oh, my God, don't ever do that again. <laughs> what an idiot I was. Uh, but, you know, the community just came out in so many ways uh, and really so wonderfully supportive. I'm just very grateful. Um, you know, literally the, the incident had happened. I had neighbors who had no idea who I was. Uh, they just saw some guy with a bike. But they were out there helping me get out of the street and calling ambulance and doing everything they could and let my wife know and everything. It was, it was just wonderful. Uh, and it was kind of funny because the fire department arrived and, and the first guy showed up and said, oh, Mr. Mayor. And then all the other neighbors <laughs> around were like, oh, that's who that is. <laughs> so the good news is, you know, they didn't know before because one of them might not have liked me much and just right. left me in the street left and you there. run yeah. me over or something. Yeah, taking the slow route to the, to the hospital. Exactly. Uh, well, good. Well, and, and you're, you're looking great. So I assume Thank you're, you. seeing you're back to— I just got my brace off a couple of weeks ago, so I'm a liberated man, uh, except my wife yet. Will not allow me to ride a bike. So. That's what I was about to ask: is when when your wife allows you. I to I do not have marital tour. permission. No, uh, that happens. So the final question uh, is: uh, you've been doing this successfully at one of the major cities in California. Uh, what's next when you think about how you want to serve your community? Yeah, it's a great question uh, because I. I mean, I have you on record for twenty twenty eight. But yeah, exactly. I am running. Thank you. <laughs> And thanks for getting that out. Hopefully, that'll help my fundraising efforts. Uh-huh. Can you raise money uh, ten years out? For I'm sure there's a okay. way. I'm sure there's Fabulous. a way. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, the short answer is I don't know, and I'm not saying that to be coy. I've got f- roughly four years left here in this term, uh, and then I have to go get a real job. Probably. Uh, what what I know is is that there's not a better job in government, in my view, than being a big city mayor because you can get so much done. You can see what you're doing in real time. You can actually see progress. You know, I know people in Congress who have been there for more than a decade uh, yeah. who can't get a bill passed. I mean, it, it's not all jobs in government are <laughs> fulfilling and, yeah. um, and meaningful as this one. And so I love the job I got. Uh, and if I didn't have term limits uh, and my wife were able to let me, I'd probably do this for the rest of my life. 
Yeah, well, it was the, the mayor of South Car- Charleston, who was he was there for like fifty years. Oh yeah, uh, and it seemed like a pretty good gig, right? You're, you're making a big difference in your community, and then you're home at night. Especially uh, Charleston, they got all those great restaurants. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Sam Licardo, thank you for joining us today. It's been an honor uh, talking with you, and uh, I think. Um, I'm hoping you gave us all a little insight and path forward to this, to the future as we look at technology and innovation and how we're going to, uh, to actually make it work for everyone in our communities. Thanks, Ryan. It was fun. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produced this podcast. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we're keeping things honorable, No tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.